Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. Right now, people are being healed mentally from anxiety, worry. Those things are broken right in here in the atmosphere of faith. Holy Spirit, we pray right now that you do what you do. God, I thank you for healing right now. Hearts that are broken, marriages that are stressed, kids that haven't heard your voice, those that are far from you, Lord. Let them feel your presence. Lord, we don't suppress that emotion, that wound, that hurt. God, we, we let it go right now in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for restoration in this house. I thank you that it's a house of transformation. That, God, you're renewing our mind. You're healing the brokenhearted. You're restoring those that have lost faith. Maybe lost faith in you, lost faith in people. God, I thank you right now for your power, for heaven to touch earth right now. In this place, let us hear from you. We honor you. We give you all the praise today as we fight for our breakthrough, believe for our breakthrough, and flex our faith for breakthrough today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. I'm telling you, that new worship album. But while we're all standing, we're going to do a little confession of faith. I'm going to do for the first time ever, I'm going to read out of my iPhone Bible. It's so weird. But I don't own a message version. And it, I'm going to read out of the passage today. But while we're standing, this is our confession of faith. If you don't believe it, that's fine. It will be your declaration of faith. And if you don't want to declare it, then you're just stubborn. And we want to pray for you after service. <laughs> Come on, trying to help you, trying to help you. We got to declare some things over our life. Once you declare it enough and you see the fruit of it, it will become a confession because you're like, I want some more of that. I want some more of that. So as a church, we're going to prophesy and believe for everything God's doing in our life. Here we go. Today, I operate in your overflow. I am grateful and focused on what lies ahead. I declare unshakable joy over my life. I live on your word, your truth, your promises. I declare great health over my life and that my soul prospers. Let your kingdom come, your will be done in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Come on. Thank you. Could have been overkill right there. I, I just need to check. No, I didn't pee myself. Okay. Sorry, that was a little much. I needed that the first service because that song, Peter, messed me up. I was like emotional. I'm like, someone just show me a line. And then they brought the roar out, reset. We were good. We were good. What's your anchor? Come on. Hey, come on. Hello. Just saying. Hello. Good anchor for me is a good lion roar. All right? So you need to find your roar. And I promise you by the end of the day, you will. You may be seated as we get into the word of God this morning. And uh, shout out to the Bombaces. Bombaces, stand up. Come on. They run all oversee connect groups and what's happening today with all the green balloons and everything. But you guys are amazing leaders, amazing coaches, amazing pastors, amazing disciplers. Uh, you've been doing ministry a long time, but you know, there's a, there's a touch of heaven on you. What, you. what you say, there's weight on because of where you've been, but where God's taking you. And in this next season, I'm believing for even greater things. I know you're preaching in just a couple weeks. You got a word for us, but the way you sit down, you just want half the word? No, that's fine. That's fine. Lord, Lord, let them, let them, get them stamina for full things. Jesus' name. Come on. No, the amazing couple. Hey, and I want to give it up for everybody that went to uh, junior high camp as a leader. I, I want to let you know you got no sleep. And when I saw when I saw some of those couples in church, I'm like, man, you all you all look good. I can't. If I got three hours of sleep for three days, I would not look like you. 
I want to get, I want to get on their supplement regime. I'm telling you, but I'm telling you, we had 250 kids go to youth camp, and for this phase in life, we got to fight for our youth. We, every one of you in this place, whether you have junior hires or not, we got to fight for them. They might be neighbors, they might be friends. They, what, we can contend. How do you support them? Hey, when you see them, give them a high five. Give them a little knuckles. Love up on them. You know, sometimes that love means, hey, let's sponsor a kid. You know, this kid wrote me a note before the 9 a.m. service. I don't want to read it because I'll cry, and I'm not, I don't need another lion roar. But it messed me up, and it's because we contended, and he got sponsored. Single mom just trying to do what she can do, but he got sponsored. Never lifted his hand in worship, never really heard from God, but he said, I heard from God, I lift my hands in worship, I'm gonna, my life is forever changed, thank you for finding me a sponsor. Listen, that's why we do it. That's why we do it. Some of you, some of you have great wisdom, and maybe let's take these young kids out for, they don't drink coffee yet, but let's just take them out to K1 and get them a smoothie, or what do we do, you know, play Fortnite with them. I don't know. I don't even know what that is. But let's, you know, there's so many junior high kids right now that don't have dads in their life. Mm. How can we be that influence? So let's find a way to do that. But um, the title of my message today is Erosion Control. Yep. None of you are pumped about that. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Garrison. See, it's good to have you back. Victoria, way to pray your son right back over here, you know? I think it's because he got married. There's greater wisdom now, discernment. Mason, good to have you back, man. Come on. It's good to see you. Look, you guys are celebrated. I never get that. Man, it's great to see you guys on the front row. But, but I'll tell you, you can call it whatever you want, but I had a little revelation the other day. And in this crazy world... We got to know what can we do in our life to fortify our life, to protect our life, not just pray a hedge of protection around us, but how do we, because the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy and tries to erode our life. So I thought erosion erosion control might be fitting, but I could tell by me throwing it out there, you're not really picking it up. So I'll I'll think of another one by the end. Maybe, um, hmm. Hmm, I don't know. I'll think about it. But the other day on the way to men's prayer, if you didn't know men and you're in the house, we have men's prayer. It's at 530 in the morning every single Tuesday. Women, you do your own thing on a different day. I have no idea. No, I'm sorry. It's Thursday. You ladies are on Thursday. I know you want to double up. You have 630 and 930. It's like, wow. Hello. Hello. We just have one. We keep it simple like Forrest Gump. Just show up. Just give us coffee. And I'm telling you, I was usually on Monday, I usually get a word, and I always want to show up. I don't want to show up to men's prayer naked. That'd be so awkward. And I mean spiritually naked. I want to show up with the word so I can help lead men. We can get breakthrough, that it's tangible. We we sink our teeth into something that if we're going to train, we're going to come out of there with some fresh armor trained up and what that fresh revelation was. And on the way to, uh, you know, that night, I'm like, Lord, hey, I need a word. Hey, don't forget about me. Uh, And then Tuesday morning, still woke up, nothing. I was like, hey, Lord, need a word. (laughs) And then uh, on the way, I'm listening to my Bible app, you know, trying to stay stay caught up with that whole thing. I'm on my way, just waiting for my word, word to drop, nothing. Finally, thank goodness for technology and apps, Starbucks app. Just ordered myself a little flat white with almond milk, short, just in case you wanted to know. And I took a little left right over here into Starbucks across the way, pulled in, They were waiting for me, and then right then, right when I'm in line, the next car up, I hear the word of the Lord, says, teach your men, compromise. The word of the Lord was compromise. And just to help you out, it's don't compromise. I'm like, cool, oh man, that's good, okay. And then I know if I can get one word, you can step out on one word. How many know that about the Lord? And he's just going to start unraveling. Sometimes God gave me a word for somebody. If I'm going to prophesy, I'm like, Lord, the minute you step out in faith, he's there to meet you right where you're at. So I knew that I had that one word. It was about to get good because I knew I had a a stoplight to get over to church. God was going to start downloading it and grab my flat white with almond milk. I'm so ready to pull out. I get right to the stoplight and... I take my sip and I'm like, mm, 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 that's not a flat white with almond milk. 
And in my mind, you know, I got a few minutes ago, I'm like, oh, that's, a, that's an Americano. And I love Americano, so I was like, oh, well, I'll drink the Americano. And then immediately, Holy Spirit convicts me and says, you didn't even make it past the stoplight before you compromised. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, but Lord, I'm, I'm fine with an Americano. And he goes, well, now you're justifying what you really wanted. So then I got totally convicted. So now I'm thinking to myself, oh, I'm battling with the Lord over a flat white and an Americano at a stoplight. What am I going to say to my men? Can't even stand in integrity at this point. So I turned back around, pulled back in the thing. I'm like, I can't believe I got to be this guy. I'm walking back up to the window. I'm so like grieving in my spirit. I have to do this. I'm like, she comes to the window. Oh my gosh, I am so sorry. I'm like, no, 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 I don't even wanna be that guy. No, 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 oh my gosh, I'm 26 weeks pregnant. I felt so bad, I knew it. As soon as you drove away, I was sick to my stomach. I was like, oh my gosh, I hope that doesn't ruin his day. Oh my gosh, I hope he comes back. And the other girl's like, I told her to chill out. You're probably gonna be cool. And I was like, I am cool. I just, I feel like, hey, like, and she goes, no, no, I already, I was hoping you'd come back. Let me get it to you, got me a fresh. Almond milk flat white, it was that. <laughs> and she goes, honestly, this is the key. She goes, it would have ruined my day. She goes, it would have been on my mind all day. I felt so bad. I'm thinking to myself, oh, wow. Get in my car and drive away. Holy Spirit says, your compromise had nothing to do about you, but it had everything to do with someone else. And that wrecked me to the point where I couldn't even get it off my mind. I shared it at men's prayer. I was like, dude, I, this just happened. Sometimes when we compromise, it's not even about our little thing. It's about the ripple effect of how our compromise can affect somebody else. If you've been watching, what's the name of that? The terminal list, dear Lord. People compromising left and right affects a lot of things. If you're watching that, just all know because you'll have bags under your eyes. You can't stop with one next thing you know. You're seven in, it's three in the morning. You're sweating. Your wife's like, I can't even sleep. You're giving me. So don't start it like at nine. Pick a Saturday, start at one in the afternoon, just get it done with. Then I can preach on it. Because I think if I preach on terminal list right now, you're all going to be offended because I'll ruin what happens. And I want to tell you so bad right now about who compromises him and the cost of it. It's affecting me right now. So I'm going to give you all one week to get caught up, and I'm preaching on it next week. You know, I was thinking in the Bible, too, all right, Lord, how do I teach on don't compromise? How, how do I teach where the enemy comes in to kill, steal, and destroy? You warn us all these things. You even say in Song of Solomon 2.15, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for the vines have tender graves. See, there's little foxes that we allow to come in, they ruin it. Right now, I'm on rabbit patrol in my house. I bought myself a little pellet gun. I mean, I'm done with them eating my passion fruit. They are messing my stuff up, so I'm messing them up. I'm now inviting friends over, it's my connect group. I started a Rabbit Hunters Connect group. We are on tilt. Bunch of grown men with flashlights. And we don't know what we're doing. I heard a ting the other day. I said, oh, I hope that's not my neighbor's house. But I look at it, I said, Lord, in the Bible, who, like I saw Joseph's life. He wouldn't compromise to the point he was thrown in jail, but he didn't care. He had his character, his name, his integrity. He was righteous before. I'm like, I like that. Abraham, man, he wouldn't compromise. He even got up after a word from the Lord and got up early, grabbed his son and said, here we go. In faith. I, there's many examples. But the one I want to read out of today, because I think it's so pertinent, is Daniel. Chapter one. See, I grew up hearing the stories of Daniel, but I was so pumped about, you know, the fiery furnace. How many of you ever heard that? You know, like, let's talk about the lion's den. See, we want to talk about those things, but listen, without chapter one, there is no lion's den. Without chapter one, the foundation, there is no fiery furnace. He had to get through chapter one. He had to go vegan on us, and I'm not even a fan. I'm a meditarian, but some of you didn't find that funny. That's okay. That's all right. 
I mean, I was watching my high team. I'm like, they're definitely Mediterraneans. Did you see the arms? It's like, hi, are you new there? <laughs> Babe, why are you laughing? <laughs> I work out. <laughs> but I look at the Bible too, and I look at, you look at Solomon. You look at Solomon because I look at a man that had great wisdom. He prayed for wisdom. He built the house of the Lord, the greatest house, the greatest temple ever built. And yet he ends his life in compromise. It was the little foxes. It was the thousand women that he was with. I can't handle one. A thousand. Try to wrap your head around that. But I'm, yeah, don't wrap your head around that. But I look at that in the Bible because here's a man that prayed for wisdom that knew exactly what the Lord wanted, that built the most incredible thing. But how did he end his life in compromise? He was a lust-driven slave at the end of his life that compromised and, and was idol, had idol worship. He let all his wives choose what? He compromised. He didn't end where the Lord wanted him to end. Matter of fact, the Lord even threw out some grace, gave him warnings, and he's still train wrecked. See, what runs, or what walks in fathers runs in kids. His dad struggled with that, same thing. But he knew how to repent. But he didn't get a grip of it. He didn't take control of it. He didn't get disciplined. He started to compromise, and those little foxes ruined what God had in store for him. You know, it's amazing because... I think about the greats that have fallen, some great pastors in the world. I was like, man, what, what we need to do to make sure that never happens? Pastor Jurgen teaches us all the time. Have great accountability. Don't get Christianese, don't get religious on us. Take off that mask. If you're struggling with something, let us know. You know why we have an altar? So your life can get altered. Sometimes if we stay where we're at, we'll stay where we're at. Sometimes we gotta get out, get uncomfortable, and run to the altar. But what is it? Because I, you know, I meet people who's like, oh, I'd never cheat. 10 years later, walking them through some infidelity. I'd never steal from my employer. And they get fired for me. I'd never, I'd never look at porn. I'd never. It's amazing. It goes from looking to suddenly they're paying for it. Which leads to the little foxes more compromise. It's the little things. You know, 90%, even Christians struggle with pornography, yet no one talks about it. The church doesn't want to talk about it. I'm starting to do this little singles thing where I want to get people connected, and then I'm hearing all this stuff. I'm like, what, what is going on with dating? And I straight up have to tell men, listen, if you're going to date one of my awakened girls, you, you better know what some biblical foundations are. You better know how to treat a lady. And I'm not a religious pastor. I grew up the guy who wrote I kissed that, what, I kissed dating goodbye. Worst book I've ever seen written on dating. Sorry if that offended you and you, you grew up with your whole premise about that. I apologize. But listen, hold her hand. Give her a kiss. You don't need to do three hours of making out to see if you like her. Like, dear, come on, we're going to talk about it. Let, where's, where's it happen? Where's the compromise? You know, it's like. Oh, yeah, we were just petting. What is petting? She's not an animal. <laughs> like, I, well, third base, then it's full send. It's too far at that point. Like, put some scales up around. My wife and I, we're, well, I'm not embarrassed to say. Like, some of you, you don't even like to hear the word horny in church. It's offensive to you. <laughs> Listen, oh, but the world goes way worse. Calm down, people. Talk about it. You know why people live in sinks? They can't even say that word. Don't compromise. It's a real thing. And so why don't you get real with it? We had a little, a little horny scale. I'd be like, all right, if I'm about, listen, scale one to 10, babe, when I'm at a four, that's my warning. It's a yellow light. <laughs> so one night we're watching, watching a movie and she leans over and kisses me and then she whispers in my ear. I said, nine. <laughs> she goes, what? No, you're not. Yes, I am. Don't do it again. She thought it'd be cute. She leans over again. I'm out of here. I got up and started running for my car, grabbing my keys. Deep, 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 deep. She's like, get back here now. I know what that meant. 
Pastor Jurgen, what do I do? I want to turn around. Get in your car. Turn off your phone. Don't answer it. When she calls, she's calling me right now. She's calling me. Just get in your car. Don't turn, turn off your phone. When you get home, turn it on and call me. Let me know you made home. Lock your door. All right. Are you sure it's the right thing? It's the right thing. Don't compromise. Click. That's discipleship. Listen, it's the tiny step. If I would have given into that one more whisper, it's the little steps. The next thing you know, my shirt's off. And come on, I look better 17 years ago, okay? Now, now, now it won't do anything, but you know. But let me tell you something. It, because I set that scale in place, it helped our relationship to stay pure. A lot of people, they just don't want to talk about because they're Christianese. The next thing you know, they're in my pastoral care. I'm like, bro, what were you thinking? I wasn't. I, it just happened so fast. Yeah. <laughs> it's a full thing. It's like, what standards are in place? You know, there is a world of TikTok and Instagram and Facebook that are literally raising our kids. Yeah, right. And if you aren't talking about the things that matter, that means somebody else is. Wow. And you don't want to be uncomfortable talking about, well, guess what? They're not afraid to talk about it in first grade with your kids. Yeah. What standards are we going to follow? There's only two churches. There's the world and there's God's way. And every day, if we're not teaching God's way, God's principles, we are compromising because they're getting drip titration. Boom, 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 boom. Until one day they're confused. Until one day, dad, I think I'm this. Boom. Your voice matters and we cannot be this. This is war. We have to be okay with having real conversations. It's amazing when I talk about people. I just had a, a girl go, hey, Dr. Matt, yeah, I went on a date with an awakened guy, and he, he just said, you know, he even serves on a team, but, you know, he's not sure he believes in the Bible on the premarital sex. I'm like, yeah, sure he does. Ask him what else he doesn't believe in the Bible. Like, oh, I believe in everything except that whole sex before marriage thing. I'd show me where that's at. What else do you need help on, bro? Get away from my girl. Go to another church, date them. My house, draw some standards. It's the little foxes that ruin what God has in store for you. I love in Galatians 6 to 7, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, one will also reap. For one who sows to his own flesh will from flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Some say blessing. James 4, 7, 8, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. Purify your hearts. Don't be double-minded. It's amazing. Listen, I love about Daniel. You know, I see in Daniel, listen, when you stick with God, you start to see unmerited favor in your life. Daniel lived a life with unmerited favor. I'm going to read out of it um, in the message version right here, Daniel 1, 1 through 21. I think they're going to bring it up on the screen for you. But I think it's such a great message, if I can get right back to it. Here it is. Daniel 1. It was the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon declared war on Jerusalem and besieged the city. The master handed King Jehoiakim over to Judah, over to him, along with some of the furnishings from the temple of God. Nebuchadnezzar took king and furnishings to the country of Babylon, the ancient Shinar. He put the furnishings in a sacred treasury. The king of Ashpenaz, head of the palace staff to get some Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men who were healthy and handsome, intelligent and well-educated, good prospects for leadership, positions in government, perfect specimens. And the, he wanted to indoctrinate them in the Babylonian language and the lore of magic and fortune telling. The king then ordered them to be served in the same menu as the royal table, the best food, the best wine. After three years of training, they would be given positions to the king's court. Four young men from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, 
Mishael and Azariah were among those selected. They were head of the palace staff, and they gave them Babylonian names. Daniel was named Belteshazzar. Hananiah was named Shadrach. Mishael was named Meshach, and Azariah was named Abednego. But Daniel, that he would not defile himself by eating the king's food or drinking his wine, so he asked the head of the palace staff to exempt him from the royal diet. The head of the palace staff, by God's grace, like Daniel. Remember that. But he warned them, I'm afraid what my master, the king, might do. He is the one who assigned this diet, and if he sees that you're not as healthy as the rest, He'll have my head. But Daniel appealed a steward who had been assigned by the head of the palace staff to begin in charge of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Try us out for 10 days. Remember that? On a simple diet of vegetables and water. And then compare us with the young men who eat from the royal menu. Make your decisions on the basis of what you see. The steward agreed to do it and fed them vegetables and water for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked better and more robust than the others who had been eating for the, from the royal menu. So the steward continued to exempt them from the royal menu of food and drink and serve them only vegetables. God gave these four young men knowledge and skill in the books and life. In addition, Daniel was gifted with understanding all sorts of visions and dreams. At the end of the time set by the king for their training, the head of the royal staff brought them into Nebuchadnezzar. When the king interviewed them, they found them far superior to all other young men. None were a match for Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they took their place in the king's service. Whenever the king consulted them on anything, on the books or on life, he found them 10 times better. Not Grand Cardone, 10X, this is Bible people. He found them 10 times better than all magicians and enchanters in the kingdom put together. Daniel continued in the king's service until the first year of reign of King Cyrus. Listen, I think it's powerful because here you have a man that decided not to compromise. And there's four main things I want to bust out of here as fast as I can. But I want to tell you how we raise this next generation matters. I look back now and, and, and I look at my dad, how he raised us. He was a Marine. He said, you're going to church. How many know we didn't argue? But it's amazing how many friends today can compromise and they tell me all the time, oh yeah, they, there's a sleepover. Okay, so what? Oh yeah, yeah, well, we just let them sleep over so they miss church. Oh, they only could do this like Zoom thing or, or microphone thing on Sunday mornings with all their friends to play Fortnite. Ah, oh, so we miss church. Oh yeah, we asked them if they wanted to go to junior high or high school camp and they just kind of weren't interested. Wow. Oh, we don't want to make them. It's amazing, the pastoral care meetings I have because somebody's got to clean up when we don't build our house on a foundation. I remember, and I thought it was pretty funny because I was thinking, um, my dad one time, I said, uh, it was, it, the movie came out, and I'll never forget it. I think I was like nine or 11 years old, and it was the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Man, that movie came out, all my friends were seeing it. Dad, I want to see Raiders of the Lost Ark. I was like, nope, I'm not taking you to Raiders of the Lost Ark. I'm like, Dad. I want to see Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's like, you're not seeing Raiders of the Lost Ark. Dad, I'm a man. You're nine. You're not a man. <laughs> I want to see it. All my friends are seeing it. Well, you're not all your friends. Okay. So we came home. I hammered them for three days. Finally, I came home and my mom made brownies. My dad set us down. Now I know this is a thing. Back then, I didn't know it was a thing. I haven't had to use this as a parent trick, but it's in my pocket. You know what I'm saying? It's right there. I'm going to, you want brownies? He sat me down, he goes, hey, so if you eat all these brownies, you can see the movie. Oh my, oh, these things are going down in 30 seconds. <laughs> Just find out the next time, dad. He goes, well, one caveat, even though your mom used the best chocolate, I mean, they are good. They're ready to go. I wanna let you know, I put some of Pepper's poop in there, which was my dog at the time. <laughs> I said, you did what? He goes, yeah, I just went out and grabbed some, and I wanted to let you know that we cooked it with Pepper's Poop, but you probably won't taste it because the chocolate's so good. You probably won't even notice. I looked at my dad, and I said, Dad, I'm not going to eat that dog poop. I don't care how good that brownie tastes. And then he goes, well, when you're ready to go see that movie, you can eat the brownies. How many know I never touched those brownies? First of all, I didn't understand the lesson because he didn't say it to me. So I was totally ticked about this poop brownie for at least a week. I'm glad you're laughing about it. 
Finally, every time, I was just giving attitude. My dad's like, why are you giving me so much attitude? You had a choice to make, you chose not to. I said, yeah, but who makes their kid poop brownies? And he goes, well, you never asked me the lesson. There's things in life and the world is trying to put poop in your life and you'll compromise it, but you'll never know what you're eating until it's too late and it will make you sick. I was like, hello. And I said, well, why can't I see that movie? He goes, because there's sex scenes and you're too young to see them. There's language in there that you don't need to hear for your ears yet. You're not mature enough spiritually so you can handle what's in that movie. But when you are, we'll go see it. So literally, I think I was 13 or 14 when I got to see Raiders of the Lost Ark. But it was funny because we had many mature conversations before I saw that movie. That opened the door for real conversations because now I was irritated why that thing might set me off, why that movie might trigger me. You know, I was listening to one of my favorite songs, my wife and I loved it. We get it, it would be the first song we play on my boat. We have, you know, and then Pastor Samuel comes and he goes, oh, have you looked up the lyrics? I'm like, why would I look up the lyrics? No one can understand what they're saying. Who cares? This is a sick beat. Hands me the phone, I start reading the lyrics. I'm like, well, dear Lord, I can't unsee that. Now I know what they're saying. You know, sometimes you gotta read the lyrics so you know what they're saying? I thought they were praying in tongues the whole time. They weren't. <laughs> they weren't. So now I'm irritated, like I can never play that song now. We go, oh, total conviction. Yes. I'm not gonna, because one day my daughter might go, oh, I love that song, my parents listen to it all the time. Oh, do you know the lyrics? I mean, it just sends down pathways. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Samuel. But it's true. We got to look into these things. We never know what we're feeding on. I'm going to skip that story just for you guys. The one thing about Daniel is too, it's it's PG-13. You guys need PG-11 real quick. Daniel outlives four kings. He prospers in a foreign land over 70 years. No matter what. See, if we trust in God, we do not compromise. No matter where you're at, God can prosper you. It's amazing how many people have to leave. Oh, I don't want to stay in California. There's a tyrant governor telling us what to do, blah, blah, blah. God can still prosper us. We don't have to compromise. We can find the right people and make a stand. See, he cooperated, but he did not compromise. My point number one that I want to teach on to say, how do we not let the erosion start in our life? How do we not compromise? How do we kick the little foxes out? It starts with this. Know your name. Know your name. Daniel means, well, it's the book of whole Daniel. It means Elohim is my judge. God is my judge. But it's amazing. As soon as he got to Babylon, they renamed him. The Babylonian name Belshazzar means Bel's prince. It's his Chaldean name. It's amazing because they wanted to give this Babylonian pagan name. They were all deity gods that they wanted to align them with, and Daniel refused. He didn't mind them calling him names, but he knew his identity. He knew his name. It was Daniel. The book isn't called Belshazzar. It's called Daniel for a reason. It's amazing. His friends would call him Daniel. He was raised in Judah. They always called him Daniel. Even though he went to another place, he was a slave there for 70 more years. Guess what? He knew his name. His name was Daniel appointed by God. God is his judge. And it's amazing how each one of them got different names. You might know Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But that wasn't their Hebrew name. What's amazing is they were only 14, 15 years of age at the time. Think about the wisdom to be identified as something, but you know your identity. See, the world is trying to cue, you know, confuse our kids with their identity, but if they know their identity, how will they be confused? If they know they were made in the image and the likeness of an almighty God, how will they be confused? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And if you're not renewing your mind on God's word, someone will be renewing it for you, starting in our education system. It's amazing that they, no matter what, see, on his way back to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem. He took the best and the brightest back to Babylon in order to train them in Babylonian ways and used for political gain. If you don't think our kids are being used for political gain, they're taking the best and the brightest. You don't think the enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy your kid's identity? Then we are drinking the Kool-Aid because there is an enemy that wants to see the next generation destroyed. If you're already 
saved and you're already into this thing, then guess what? They wanna try to confuse your kids to get them away from the Lord, get them away from the truth, get them away from God's word. We gotta bring them back and build a foundation. The good thing is they're raised up until they're 14 in Judah, the house of praise. They know who they were. And guess what? When times got rough, they landed on that strong foundation. Know your name. Know who they were. There's significance in knowing who you be. Everyone has insecurities. Everyone's stuff is going to come up. Face those insecurities. That's why we need each other. That's why we need to press in. Not one of us is above having an insecurity somewhere about something. But don't let that insecurity define you, keep you quiet. It's amazing. We could sing that song, Peter, emotion might come up, but so many people try to suppress it. They're not really sure. They haven't felt emotion because our heart has been guarded so long. But when you get under the presence of the Almighty and you feel, let him heal something, let him restore something, let him reveal something, you have gifts that God wants to use and develop on the inside of you. But if you don't know your identity, Daniel's gifts, you don't know what they are until chapter 2. You didn't know he could interpret dreams in this. They had to deal, God was dealing with his identity. Do you know who you are? Will you not compromise? Will you stand in the test of not taking a knee? Number two, control your appetite. What I love about this, go back and read it. Here were four slaves in a new country and they were given the opportunity to dine with the king at the king's table. The finest food, the finest wine, Here you are being enticed. But Daniel knew something. He felt like it was dishonoring to God. He knew that that food was used to sacrifice to their gods. And whatever their gods didn't touch, they would bring to the king's table. So they were eating this deity sacrifice. And Daniel just said, no, I don't feel right. It's not right in my spirit. You know what's right. The Lord will direct your steps. You'll have discernment and conviction. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Not to make you feel shame. It's amazing how we can let guilt and shame, guilt is a conviction. If you feel a little guilt, let that be a conviction. The Holy Spirit's saying, shame is another thing. We're not meant to walk in shame. We're not meant, get shame off you. Shame is of the devil. Guilt, hey, hey, knocking on your door. Hey, should you be looking at that? Hey, don't be tempted. It's amazing. We just got to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. When you decide not to compromise, God's grace will give you favor. See, he didn't compromise. Next thing you know, he has favor with the head of the palace. See, God will give you unmerited favor when you learn not to compromise. I learned many times growing up, I didn't know this. I got in trouble in Washington, D.C., and then all of a sudden, I just knew that I didn't want to rat anybody else out. I bought the screwdriver that unlocked the window that got all his kids on the roof of a hotel, and we... They went, I went out there the first night, taught everybody how to do it, but I didn't go out the second or the third night because I didn't feel well. I drank too much sugar as a seventh grader. <laughs> but because I confessed, I know God showed me favor. I took it. I didn't want anyone else to get in trouble. I did the hard thing. I got reprimanded. They couldn't fly me home, so I stayed at the top company with some people that owned the travel company. You know when you go to seventh and eighth grade back into Washington, D.C.? Well, guess what? I stayed with the owner's son. I didn't know that. Unmerited favor. He snuck me out, showed me all the things. I got to still get the inscription of my dad's Vietnam veteran brothers that passed away on the wall. I, all these things happened. Not only that, I built a, built a rela- relationship with that family. Not only that, my brother got to go to D.C. for free. Not only that, when I went to college, I got to go there and every... Uh, every summer I'd go back and work for the company. It paid for my entire grad school. All this unmerited favor because I decided not to compromise. I could have blamed everybody else. I could have hid. I could have lied. I felt like lying. I did lie the first time and I got so convicted I told the truth. Knewing I would get in trouble when I got home. But you know what? I didn't compromise. And because of that, I know I was blessed and it keeps on blessing me. There's many times I look back in my life, I'd rather take the high road Rather, if we learn how to control our appetite. See, Daniel said, listen to, let, listen to me, let's, let's uh, eat differently. He's pitching him. He says, give us 10 days. 10 is the number of test. Right. Test us in 10 days. Yeah. Malachi 3.10 says, hey, Lord, come on, test me in this, that I will not throw open the window of heaven and pour out such blessing. You won't be able to contain it. God's not afraid to you to test him. See, Daniel was saying, hey, test us in 10 days. And secretly, he's like, Lord, show up. Come on, 10 days. I'm testing you. As much as he wanted to be tested, he was putting everything. He was putting his faith in the Lord to be tested. 
God's not afraid of your test. Test him in this. When you have enough faith in God, you start testing him. That's what I've learned. When I started getting rattled with my first house, I had probably this much faith. I'm like, all right, Lord, I don't have the money for this first house, but uh, hey, you told me I could do it. Guess what? That gave me enough faith muscle. After I got that house, I started looking around differently. I had a little faith chip on my shoulder. <laughs> Lord, if you say it, I'm going to do it. See, I learned how to flex that faith muscle after my first house. When it came years later, eight years later to this next house, guess what? I already had my faith muscle. I didn't even lose sweat over it. You know what God was teaching me on this next house? How to flex my spiritual warfare, how to go to battle, how to pray, how to take territory, how to take ground, how to contend with the enemy. I had the faith for the house. I just now had to know how to get down and wrestle with the enemy and not let go till he was penned, That's choked out. Listen, you got to build faith and you know how to pray. You got to learn what it takes, what season you're in. Daniel made a decision not to participate with the king. It's amazing that if you look at the age, the wisdom that he had, knowing the discernment. In 2006, I was invited to a bachelor party of someone I looked up to. I looked up to this chiropractor, he's very successful. He said, hey, I want you to come up to a bachelor's party in Vegas, 2006. I'm like, yeah, I had just met Pastor Jurgen. I was like, okay. So I went, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. Man, we were having a great time. We had so much fun. Went to a show. We went out to an incredible dinner. And then, then I was tested. He said, all right, guys, hey, we're going to go to this strip club. I was like, oh, all right. All right, we're going to the strip club. Oh, my gosh. I just met Michaela thinking to myself, this probably isn't good. And I was watching all the other guys, and they're amped out of their mind. Yeah. And I'm sitting there going, man, I just got back going to church. Oh, I don't want to compromise this. Okay, 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 okay. So how many of you have ever done the duck out? Yeah. Have you ever just like, I'm just going to duck out of here. No one's going to see me. And on the duck out, of course, I get called to the carpet. And I go, hey, yeah, and I wanted to say I'm just not feeling well. I wanted to say, oh, I ate too much. Yeah. Gotta go. <laughs> I wanted to say a lot of things, but I just heard myself, finally, as they put me in the corner, I said, it goes against my core values. Yeah. I'm not gonna go. It, to me, it's just dishonoring of the girl I'm dating. Wow. And they made fun of me. <laughs> I was a total tool. But I remember, I sat there, and I was like, well, I'll probably never be invited back. And then I just said, but call me afterwards. I'll be up late. I don't care. I'll stay up all night with you guys. We'll do whatever. I'm just not going there. They all went. I remember I was walking back to my room going, oh, such a tool, but that was the right thing to do. Give myself the pep. And all of a sudden, the guy walked up next to me and goes, hey, man, I'm going to join you. And we went and hung out. We had a great night. We spent um, until they were back. We had a great time. I'll tell you something about that. I didn't see that guy until about three months later. I'd been to... Uh, uh, the rock a few times, and I was walking out of the service because, um, you know, C3 back, Awaken used to be C3. It wasn't fully going at the time. We were just prayer meetings. I walked out of there, and the guy goes, hey, Dr. Matt, remember me, Vegas? I go, yeah. Ended up going to his connect group. Me and that dude now are both pastors at Awaken Church. That guy was John Hendricks, the only other guy that didn't compromise at a bachelor party in Vegas. God showed unmerited favor with one of my best friends today, and we still remember where we were at when we made that decision. He didn't want to dishonor his bride. He wanted to do the right thing. He was sitting there sweating it out, and because I made a bold move, we got to walk that out, and we still get to do life. Look at us. We're leading two of the biggest campuses in Awakened Church, doing radical things for the kingdom, and I know it started with that little fox that we stepped on back in 2006. See, when you start to control your appetite, you watch what God does. How you control it matters. You know, in 2003, February, the Columbia Challenger exploded. What I learned about that when I was doing some research on it back in the day, there was 113 launches before that space shuttle. There was an anomaly on every single one of those launches. A little piece of foam broke off. They looked into it. They never saw anything. They weren't really show, sure. They looked at engineers, and they saw the price that it would cost to re-engineer that whole little piece of foam, break it off. They even had a name for it. But they ignored it because it came off 113 times. It was just an anomaly. But in that, what was a common thing, NASA got comfortable with it, 
assumed it wouldn't hurt anything, and it took the lives of seven people, wow. all because they didn't want to re-engineer it because it was just a little piece of foam. Evaluate your life. Yeah. Where are the little foxes? What are the little compromises that can take us out what God's trying to give us favor in? I love it because if you think about your appetite, it might not hurt you today, tomorrow, next month, but if you keep letting the wrong things in your system, if you keep feasting on the wrong diet, if we would have just changed our diet, we wouldn't be sick or compromised. So many people can make little changes that can change the outcome of your life right now today. Look, if you look at verse 17 to 21, I could preach three sermons in verses 17 to 21. I encourage you to go read Daniel 1, 17 to 21 all on your own. I think it's that powerful. I'm gonna give you just a one revelation out of the many, but in your sermon, in your quest to honor God, God honored them right. in these verses. If you go back and you look, listen, favor isn't fair. I call it hashtag the FOG. You need to be FOG in your life, favor of God. I don't apologize when people, I just ran into somebody like, oh, it was, it was, it was. I'm like, oh, well, you want me to apologize because God's blessing me? You don't know what I've done on the back end. Right. Right. You don't know the sacrifices I made. I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, I'm sacrificing some. I don't need that. Yeah. I already know what God's doing in my life. But why don't you just start to live for and believe for the favor of God over your life? If you can learn to honor God. See, God prospers all four of those guys. All four of them, educationally, physically, mentally, and emotionally. After three years, the best of Babylon couldn't touch them. All together, they still 10 x them. Four guys that stuck together with accountability, discipleship, and never compromised. If we can learn, we're the little foxes. I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to find somebody else with my core values. I'm going to stick to my guns. And number, point number three is trust your capacity. Yeah. Wow. Number two is control your appetite. Number three is trust your capacity. Know what you have on the inside of you. There are gifts that the devil tries to get you not operating in. There are things God has given you that he wants to be able to use you for his kingdom, to do radical things, because there's a world that needs the gift on your life. But if we compromise, God can't prosper us in these areas. Where do you need to be blessed educationally, physically, mentally, emotionally? Maybe wisdom. See, God prospered them because God said, because you honored me to keep my name, to keep my word and to keep my standards, I'm gonna bless you. Good. Only two claps on that. See, they just didn't pass. I gotta tell you, they just didn't get by in a society. Listen, Babylonia was a wild world. It wasn't godly. How do you make godly choices in a crazy world and still get blessed? Not get judged, not get canceled. You stand on the word of God. You stand on his standards and you stand on his name. You don't apologize. You don't have to go throw Bibles. Daniel didn't get out there and say and judge them and tell them what he was going to do. Call me a different name. I'm just going to eat a little differently. I'm not against you, king, but I'm for my God. You don't need to be against things. You just need to be for godly principles. You don't need to be against, they wanna lose their lifestyle and then train wreck. You're there to love them anyways. Quit judging them. I want all my gay and lesbian patients to be able to come to this house and feel love. I love them, God loves them. They're making bad choices. I'm not going to get in line and live the way they're living, but I'm still going to love them. If they come to this house to get freedom, to find truth, I'm going to tell them the truth in love and set them free. Some of us don't know how to do that because it gets too uncomfortable to have the conversation. I don't care. I know my God loves them, so I'm going to go there. Some will, some won't. Who cares? Who's next? I'm going to love people where they need to be loved. God did it for me. I'll never forget where I came from. See, sometimes we can get in this Christianese world and we forget where we came from. I, love, I will never stop doing what I do in the marketplace, in the world, because it reminds me I get to see broken people every day that don't know Jesus. And I'm there, I might be the only Jesus they ever see, and I'm not perfect, but I can love on them when they come see me. I can be the invitation. I can help them get out of compromise that they lost their way. They lost their identity. They aren't controlling their appetite. We're never too far above it. Let's not get too cocky. 
We're just choices away from, we just don't wake up one day and say, I wanna do this. It's the little foxes that get us thinking wrong. We're not renewing our mind like we should. We're not checking our heart like we should. They just didn't pass though. They passed with A pluses. God will give you favor with teachers. He will give you favor in the marketplace. He will give you favor in areas you have no expectation if we could just follow his principles. I love it. It's, I've always thought God goes before me. He goes, these aren't the drones you're looking for. I never made my people in a health facility mask up. I gave them free choice. They want to wear it. They don't want to wear it, but I never made my employees. I said, I live in America. You're not going to do it. I had hundreds of people calling the, calling the health department on me. When they show up, they'd walk in, they'd look around, they'd be like, why aren't you wearing a mask? I'm like, because I live in America. They go, thank you. They never find me. It was God's favor, a hand of protection over my office. I guarantee it was. My success is predicated on supernatural favor. It's not Matt Hubbard. It is supernatural favor predicated on his grace. I know that. I don't take it for granted. I give him honor where honor is due. I want to land on this because I think it's so important. You know, when I opened a restaurant, I remember the people that were doing the whole thing. I want to put scripture on a cup. So did some other people. And I remember just seeing, I'm like, man, I'll put scripture on the table. I'll put it on the wall. I don't care. Put some scripture on there. Came down to, you know, you can't just be a part of something unless, you know, you got other people involved. So I put a scripture on a cup. You know who I learned it from? Chick-fil-A and what I love about it when I look at Chick-fil-A you got to understand something I wish I could be as gutsy as them one day maybe I will be if you need a sourdough sandwich right after church right in San Alejo Hills God bless you go get one just mention the word uh, compromise for 10% off shameless plug no I'm just joking but when I opened it it's funny it's like man Chick-fil-A this is serious because seven days a week that's income on that day that can make you or break you See, they have half the stores of their competitor, KFC. KFC has double the stores, Chick-fil-A. But Chick-fil-A on six days, not seven, is 3X more successful than KFC. Favor of the Lord. They pray over every employee. There is favor on them. The owner said, I heard from the Lord and I knew that I was supposed to honor the Sabbath, so I do. All my employees know why. They, they don't back down. They say, you're going to honor the Lord on that Sabbath. If you don't want to, that's up to you. But if you work for us, we honor the Lord on the Sabbath. They, they're closed on Sundays. Now you got someone singing songs about closed on Sunday, check for that. You know what I mean? It's like, I think about them because... On half the locations, they 3X their competition. They have great re greater revenue than every pizza store in America put together. You think about that. That's how successful Chick-fil-A is. When you put God first, when you trust God, and mentally you say to yourself, I live for God, I die for God. I do not compromise. I live for God, I die for God, I do not compromise. Do you think I said that when I was younger? No, but I didn't know how important it was to live a life without compromise. See, what they stood for in Babylon is what they learned in Judah. How we raise our kids matter. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 60, a man gifts make room for him and brings him before the great. Daniel stood before kings. I've stood in rooms. I'm like, why am I here? I'm praying for people. I don't even know why I'm praying for. I'm invited to some boat and someone introduces the dude that's there like the next Billy Graham. But do you know who they called up to pray? They called me to come up and pray. You know who they had come worship? Eric Rafferty and me. I got to bring my worship team to this boat of high level achievers. I'm like thinking to myself, what are we doing? It's because God is going to appoint. I don't know why I was there, but due to relational equity, standing before kings, because I'm unwilling to compromise, God promotes us. Listen, if he'll do it for me, he'll do it for you. God wants to show unmerited favor for you and let them highlight the foxes. Don't get highlighted the foxes and feel guilty. Thank God for highlighting where there's compromises. I didn't know I was compromising sipping an Americano until God revealed it. It's the little fox that will take you out. It's not even about you. I go back, I made that girl's day just because I came back, it's, I'm sorry. Where in our life are we compromising that God could work with? Proverbs says, train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart, depart from it. Listen, I just want to end just knowing this. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 
I tell my kids, as for me and my house, we're going to church. We're going to get them around a foundation of truth. We got to figure out how we can find a connect group. My point four, I can't even preach on, is find your tribe and love them hard. Find your tribe. Get in a connect group. Go to one. Date them, for goodness sakes. Just go and find the exact one you need to be in. God will highlight it. Here's why. We got to teach biblical truths as our kids grow up. The first teacher is the parent. And if you're not parenting them, TikTok is. This whole philosophy, we just want our kids to find themselves. Let me help you. That's a crap philosophy. They need to find truth in the word of God, not find themselves in a world of chaos. I'm way over, but I want you to think about this and I'm gonna pray for you. On Tuesday night, on Tuesday morning, I got my bell rung. On Tuesday night, the Lord doubled down on me. I got together with a financial planner and my attorney. I don't know why my attorney wanted to come to my house. It's so he's never done that. We cooked for him. We cracked open a bottle of wine. I was like, make sure I honor this guy. And he broke down. He just told me, hey, your trust is kind of weak. And I know one day you're going to be out in restaurants, have a business. I'm an entrepreneur. I'll be thinking I'm going to become a billionaire off the church. Don't worry. I will be one of the biggest tithers, though. You can check that. But I'll tell you that as an entrepreneur, things happen. And so he's sitting down telling me and asking me tough questions. Who's in your tribe, Dr. Matt? I know you live by core values, but who's in your tribe? And we start going down like, okay, yeah, I have this, I have this couple. I have some amazing people in my life. He goes, do you? And he says, see, you've got a one bucket trust. I need you to have a seven bucket trust. I'm gonna take you down to level three, maybe level four, let's see. And then after that, that's when you become really financially stable. You'll need these deeper things. So I sat there listening to him and he's asking me questions. All right, good. So usually the people that love your kids that you wanna train up with your core values might be family, a grandparent, something like that, or a very close aunt, uncle, friend, brother, sister. Do they have your values? I'm like, oh yeah, we got that, blah, blah. Good, so if you're worth 20 million, can those same people handle that type of money? I was like, oh no. <laughs> And he goes, well, good, who can? And your friends. So we'll have one bucket. They're gonna raise your kids' moral conviction and values. Now you're gonna have another one that's gonna manage all your money. Who are those people? I was like, oh, so, babe, who are tithers? Who's our friends that are tithers? Okay. All right, who's our friends that can handle that sort of understanding, the good stewardship, the talents, the one, the three, the five. They're gonna multiply my talents that I left the legacy for my kids, 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 three generations. Like the Bible says that I'm trying to lean towards. Who's gonna take care of them? financially. Okay, good. I don't want them to be trust fund babies. I don't want them to be squandering money. I want them to learn principles. Here's the thing. And all of a sudden they're like, all right, what's your family constitution? Family constitution? I don't even have one. Good. Who will live in it? So now my head is spiraling out. It's now 11 o'clock at night. My wife's brain is half on the floor. We're like, oh my gosh, what do we do? And you know something that hit me? I'm not here to play around anymore with who my friends are because here's what I learned in that moment. He goes, who could handle that financial stewardship the same way you would? And I said, well, I gotta train them up. I gotta disciple better. And they said, yeah, you do. If you don't have anyone right now you think could handle that wealth for your kids, 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 it's that important. I said, you're right. And he goes, okay. And I, I gave him a name of a couple. And he goes, great. Even Christians, 50% of the church gets in divorce of those two, if they get a divorce, which one are you gonna to choose to handle their finances? I'm like, I gotta think another level. I just picked them. They can't get a divorce. Well, you better tell them. <laughs> I was just spun out thinking, you're right. And then of the two, because I love them both, who would I pick? It's getting weird. These are things that no one thinks about because we're so busy going out to dinner, having fun with our friends. Do I sit down and have the tough conversations with my friends about everything we do together matters? Let's build the kingdom. Let's build our life. Let's leave a legacy for your kids, for my kids, for their grandkids. Can we have real conversations? Let's not be afraid to talk about money, about the Lord blessing us. I want to tell my friend, look, I think you're compromising in this area of your life. It's because I love you. I want the best for you. I want to see you thrive. I don't want you to compromise the little foxes steal what you have. I love my friends. I love their kids. Their kids are off the rail. Let's talk about it. Let's be real friends. Do life together. Find your tribe. Find the values that you want to raise your kids around. And if you're not here, Who's going to help raise them? Who's going to look after them? Who we do life with matters. Let's bow our head and close our eyes. I want to pray for all of you. And 
Listen, if you felt like maybe there's been some areas of compromise in your life, I wanna pray for you right now. If there's been areas where the little foxes have been coming in and just feeling discouraged, listen, God is a redeeming God. He comes to restore. He comes to take back. He comes to dust you off and set you up on high places. He's not here to shame you. He's here to bless you. And if we can honor God, if we can honor his word, if we can honor the things that he puts before us, if we can be good stewards, he can set you in front of kings. Know your identity, control your appetite, and know your capacity. God's gonna do radical things with the gift on your life if we learn not to compromise with where we're at. If that's you today saying, I wanna come back to Christ, I wanna give everything, I wanna repent, it's just, I wanna ask for forgiveness, I wanna, I'm done with this compromise. If that's you today, I wanna pray for you, just lift your hand. Thank you for those hands up everywhere. Thank you for being bold enough. That's where it starts. Sometimes, man, the devil's like, don't lift your hand. That's ju There's zero judgment in this house, but this is how you get free. I always say, reach up to heaven and pull down your miracle. God, I thank you for every hand lifted today. God, I thank you, Lord. We draw the line in the sand against the enemy. We will not compromise. God, I thank you for righteousness. I thank you for Matthew 6, 33, Christians. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. God, I thank you for favor in this house. I thank you for blessing in this house with the devil meant to destroy. God, we walk in your unmerited blessing, grace, and favor. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.